Hello, how are you doing, Kara? Um, and there's cholesterol. Yeah, just kind of. And then your fat soluble vitamins. That's kind of where I wanted to go next. So you have your vitamin A, D, E, and K. And I'm not going to go into a whole micronutrient lecture here because I'll keep you here for several days if we go there. But um, your fat soluble vitamins are your A, D, E, and K. And they t A tends to be found in organ meats. So the one thing that I learned in metabolism, yes, I learned one thing the first time I took it. When I had to teach it, then I learned everything else. But when I took it as a student, the only piece of information that I retained from that class was don't eat polar bear liver because you'll get hypervitaminosis A and die. So if you just my plan. God damn. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Rip. Uh, so, yeah, um, typically organ meats tend to be high in A. Uh, D tends to be in milk because they fortify it with D. Um, there's one plant source of D, and that's your shiitake mushrooms, tend to be high in vitamin D. Um, then your vitamin E, that's pretty easy to get. That's in canola oil. You can get it there. You can get it in some seeds. And then your vitamin K is in your leafy green vegetables. Out of the four, your vitamin K is the one you do not really store. You store very trace amounts in cell membranes, but you don't really store it. Whereas the A is typically, as you can imagine, stored in the liver. Your D is stored in your fat cells along with the E. So that's one of the hypotheses they have about why we have low vitamin D problems now. They've um, theorized that maybe we're storing a bunch of the vitamin D that we get in our fat stores and it's getting sequestered into fat. We don't know that for sure, but that's been proposed. Um, so functions of fat. Why, why do we need fat? The number one function of fat is obviously to store energy because Historically, we'd go through periods of famine that were followed by periods of lots and lots of food, right? Abundance. So in order to survive that famine, you had to store... You have a question? I see you looking at something. No. no. Oh. So if you're going to survive a famine, you want to have plenty of body fat to live off of, right? So, so that you don't starve to death. Um, so that's one reason. The second reason, which is very relevant to this talk, is you store body fat not just around your waistline, you're storing it in your joints, in your connective tissues, areas that don't typically get a lot of blood flow. Now you got some cushion, you got some warmth. And this is one of the reasons I think that underweight lifters tend to report lots of joint injuries when they're trying to run the linear progression underweight. You know, skinny guys are always complaining their backs and knees and elbows hurt. Then they get, start gaining some weight and stuff stops hurting because you're not just gaining body fat in your midsection, you're gaining it around your joints. And if you gain it around your joints, they have a little more cushion and warmth, they're less likely to hurt. So this is one of those reasons why, you know, when you get a guy who's 6'3", 130, you know, you're telling him to gain fat and muscle. You're gonna have him eat 5,000 calories, you're gonna push his body weight up, and uh, he's gonna gain muscle from it because he's gonna be training and adding weight to the bar like he's supposed to. And uh, He's also going to be gaining fat, but we're not telling him to, you know, look like a pregnant lady, but, but he needs to gain fat. He's not going to walk around with visible abs because that's counterproductive to lots of things, but it's very counterproductive to trying to train with a heavy weight because chances are if you don't have body fat over your abs, you probably don't have body fat over your elbows, your tendons, your knees, your back, where you need it to provide that warmth and cushion. I have a hard time using the word epidemiology and science in the same sentence because of obvious reasons, but there was a whole lot of epidemiological data collected in the 70s, 80s, and 90s that looked at fitness and adiposity. And they were measuring fitness based on VO2 max, volume of oxygen consumed, right? The maximum amount of oxygen you can take in. So remember earlier what I said about the indirect calorimetry? You can put the mask on, run a ramp treadmill test so you can't go anymore, and then you'll measure your maximum oxygen consumption. The higher that number is, the lower the risk of cardiovascular disease. Now, what they found was that being normal weight and having a low VO2 max was at a much, carried a much higher risk of cardiometabolic disease than being overweight or obese with a high VO2 max. So, in essence, you were better off being fit and fat than unfit and lean. And we've known this for several decades. He just didn't sell a bunch of books and make people laugh, you know. Fat sources, well, it's in everything, first of all. But these are the ones we, if you're going to focus on getting good quality. So with fat, I don't, 
tell anybody to pay attention to quantity unless you're a very hard gainer. Typically, you're going to get enough total fat grams in your diet without even thinking about it. It doesn't really require an effort if you're trying to get enough. What does require effort is getting it from the right places, so you have to know where to go, right? Uh, nuts, seeds, avocados, fish, uh, canola oil, olive oil, all those are pretty good sources of fat, olives, um, and you don't need a whole lot of them because remember the density, the caloric density of fat is twice that of carbs, more than twice that of carbs. So a little bit goes a long way, right? So what could be, you know, a giant bowl of, of giant salad that fills an entire large bowl may have a fraction of the calories as a palm full of peanut butter, you know? So that's how you kind of want to look at it. You know, when you're eating a high carb diet, that's uh, lower in fat, you're eating a lot more food. If you're eating a high fat diet that's lower in carb, you're eating a lot less food, but you're gonna be fuller. So that's one of the, um, one of the uh, selling points for a low carb keto diet is that you're full all the time, you're not hungry, you know? But you can't train. That's the problem with it. You can't really use fat effectively when you're training. Everybody clear on that? All right, so the fourth macro is gonna be alcohol chemical name is ethanol, um, abbreviated E-T-O-H by the biochemist, um, contains seven calories per gram. It is not a carb. Everybody got that? It's not a carb. Everybody thinks, oh, I just drank beer, or had some wine or, you know, some hard liquor. I ate a it's all those damn carbs, you know? It's not a carb. It actually almost has twice the caloric density of carbs. So seven calories per gram of alcohol versus four calories per gram of carbohydrate. So it's actually closer to the caloric density of fat, which is kind of interesting. Um, in small doses, it can be beneficial to cardiovascular health. So they say that um, if you have two drinks as a male, which is, let me write this one up, one drink. I don't want people going home and drinking, you know, five pours in one glass and saying, oh, that's a drink. Twelve ounces of beer. Not the IPA high proof stuff either, just your regular <laughs> beer that we don't like to drink. <laughs> Coors Light. 1.5 ounces of 80 proof spirits, so, which I also don't like to drink. <laughs> and four ounces of wine. That is one drink. I used to just say, oh, a glass of red wine, but now they're saying, oh, one drink for males, two for females, can increase HDL, which is your good cholesterol. Um, in large doses, can be toxic and hazardous to your health. Could be a lot of fun, too, but I didn't just say that. <laughs> Depends who you ask. It's not fun for me. Um, that's beyond the scope of this discussion. I'm not going to talk about booze here. If you're over 21, you know, I'll have some with you. Um, fat needs for the injured lifter. Um, there's some evidence su supporting the use of omega-3 fatty acids, specifically Icasa pent pentanoic acid, EPA, or DHA um, have anti-inflammatory properties. You can typically get these in fish oil or fish. Um, but again, there's some 99% of nutrition research is complete bullshit because we don't know what else people are eating. So remember that when I say that. When I say there is data, consider that under that assumption. Um, the, the data suggests that maybe having too much of this when you're in, infl in an inflamed state can blunt some of those necessary adaptations to get out of that inflamed state. So you don't want to overdo this. Um, but total fat intake, I'd say fat quality is probably more important than uh, fat quantity. You know, it's really hard to stay on a very low-fat diet, so you know, I don't think you really have to think about, you know, not getting enough, but the, but the quality is more important. You want to go back to those sources I talked about earlier. Well, what you're talking about is um, if you eat a bunch of healthy fats. All fats, have, all fats have unsaturated and saturated fats. When you're eating something like bacon or a McDonald's hamburger or 70-30, you're getting more saturated than you would if you're eating an avocado. So are we clear on that part? 
So now when you're eating more saturated fat, especially when it's done chronically over time in very high quantities, I'm not talking about you know, a 19-year-old kid drinking a gallon of whole milk a day for three months. I'm talking about the guy that eats donuts every morning, gets a double quarter pounder at McDonald's with french fries, and has eaten things like that every day for 30 years. That accelerates the deposition of plaques in the arterial walls, which can eventually lead to cardiovascular disease.